Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm Pastor Rocket, and I'm glad that you're here with us today. The Lord has a message for us that I'm excited to share with you. If you would turn with me to Acts chapter 26, we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 19. The book of Acts chapter 26, verses 12 through 19. The title of the message this morning is Heavenly Vision. The Heavenly Vision. Let's begin reading out of Acts chapter 26. Verse 12 starts like this. Paul is speaking, and let me give you a little bit of context. He's speaking to, speaking to King Agrippa about why he is in town doing what he's doing. And that's enough context for this this morning. So here we are. Paul is speaking, and he says, I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priests. King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. And we all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And then I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and of what I will reveal to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles. I now send you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that by faith in me they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time this morning. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. I thank you for the preservation of it and the fact that you've made it accessible to us, that it is easy for us to find and to hear and to understand in the age in which we live. Father, I pray this morning that you would honor that we've gathered to hear it. Lord, that it wouldn't return void, but that your purpose would be accomplished because we were gathered. Open our minds and our hearts and our ears and our spirits to receive what you have for us today. And let your anointing rest on me so I'll speak clearly the message that you have for us this morning. We welcome your presence. We're grateful for your word. And we're glad to hear what you have for us this morning. We receive it and we receive you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you don't remember anything else this morning, I want you to remember this. We alone are responsible. I'm going to say that part again. We alone are responsible for receiving and remembering and keeping our focus upon God's vision for our lives. Christ always enters our life and gives us a vision. Now, I don't mean that it's like some vision quest where you, that you do a bunch of peyote and go out into the woods and get high or go out into the desert and become so dehydrated that you start to hallucinate. That's not the kind of vision we're talking about when we speak to what the Lord does. The Lord comes into our lives with a vision, and we know that that vision, we see it here in this passage, is not all about me just becoming a better person. It's about me learning to serve the purpose of God by becoming more like him. In fact, when Christ enters our lives, we know he always comes with a vision because there's no human being in all of human history that has ever encountered God and not walked away changed because of what they have seen. There are stories throughout this book of men and women who have had an encounter with God. Men who met him on the street that were broken and walked away healed. People who hadn't seen him yet and they go up to the top of the mountain and someone like Moses comes down and he looks different to everyone that sees him because he's been in the presence of God. He has had a vision or has caught sight of something that he had no understanding or, or no comprehension of before he came into the presence of God. God comes into your life and he comes with a vision. In fact, he says it here in Acts when Paul is talking about what happened to him. He meets the Lord on the road unexpectedly. And in verse 16, the Lord says to Paul, I have appeared to you and I am here so you will see more clearly. If you take that word, that phrase apart, I have appeared to you. Appear means to see something clearly you could not see before. Now what's interesting about this is when the Lord shows up and gives you a vision, it doesn't mean that he's going to reveal something to you by creating a thing that didn't exist. The Lord is going to reveal something that's always been there. Appeared means show you something clearly that you couldn't see in the first place. It's been there the whole time. There's a verse in Scripture that says we see through a veil darkly. There are things happening around us. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We could go on and on. God makes clear to us throughout Scripture that there is not just what we can see. There are things we cannot, and God's vision will make clear to us things that have always been there but that we weren't aware of. Sometimes those are things about myself, and sometimes those are things about the world around me that I didn't see. 
The thing he doesn't say is that I'm going to make you feel a certain way. He doesn't say I've come to give you certain feelings and sensations. You will certainly have those. We have awe and we experience wonder and we experience joy, sometimes even relief when we talk about being unburdened from sin that's in our life. But God did not show up to make you feel better. He appeared so that you would see him and see things more clearly than you did before. In fact, he appears so that you can see things you may not have even known were there. Why am I stuck in this place? Why can I not ever ever seem to get out of this rut of being constantly broke, of being constantly sick, of never seeming to be able to get ahead, of nobody ever really seeming to love me, of my relationships not working out? Why am I stuck? There's an obstruction between you and where the Lord wants you to be that you can't see. And when the Lord shows up, he will give you a vision of that thing that what that you didn't know was there he didn't show up to make you feel good in fact the vision of the lord will sometimes make you uncomfortable by showing something that you don't necessarily want to deal with but that needs to be removed in order for you to become closer to him and do the work that he has for you to do in the modern church we focus way too much on the feeling of faith We focus way too much on feelings. We get this idea that we need to feel free. We need to feel lighter. We need to feel happier. We need to feel closer to God. The problem is the Lord didn't say, I've come to make you feel better. He said, I've appeared to you so that you will see something more clearly. The more important portion of the event of your salvation and your encounter with Jesus Christ is that God allows you to see. Not that he's allowed you to feel something. God shows up and he brings a vision and he provides a direction for us for the purpose of serving him. God brings a vision for the purpose of provoking us to action. Not just so we can see some great thing and have some great get together where we say these are the great visions and testimonies I have of the Lord. Certainly those are encouraging to people. But the Lord says I'm bringing you a vision because I need to inspire you to action. Verse 16, Paul says, I was told to stand up on my feet because the Lord says, I have appeared to you for this purpose. We must be standing on our feet and prepared to receive the vision and accomplish a purpose, not seated so that we can receive something to feel better about until the next good feeling comes along. We've got to be standing to receive the vision. Paul's encounter is not the only time we see this in Scripture. If you look back at the fifth chapter of Joshua and read the story at the end of that chapter, Joshua encounters the captain of the Lord's army. And when he encounters that commander, his first instinct is to bow to the ground. And that angel looks at him in verse 15 and he says, No, 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 no. Remove your sandals and stand to your feet because this place is holy. You have had a vision of what the Lord has in mind. And when God shows you a vision, it's not so that you can just sit and think and absorb and meditate and feel good like you're wrapped in a warm, cozy blanket of God's goodness. There are seasons and times for that. But the Lord gives us a vision because he wants us on our feet prepared to move forward with what he's shown us that we should do. There's times and seasons, but the vision season is not the one where we sit and soak. We must be standing and at the ready and prepared to act very quickly. The prophet Habakkuk in the Old Testament, chapter 2, verse 2, this is a verse we've heard many, many times if you've been in church. The Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. Some translations say, so that the runners can read it. There's a lot of study that's been done on this, but no matter how you interpret this verse, at the end of the day, the vision is for people that are moving. The vision and the goal and the purpose is for people that are in motion. Paul was active when he received the vision of the Lord. Verse 12, it says, I was traveling with authority and a commission. I was active in doing some things. And now here's the thing. Paul was active in doing the wrong thing at the time. This is fascinating in the context of how the Lord works with us because we think, I got to get my life in order. I got to get some things together. I've got to be doing things right before I can go to church, before I can pray, before I can spend some time with Jesus, before my business is going to grow, before my marriage is going to work out. If we believe the way this is written, 
Paul was actively in the process of doing the wrong thing, and he received a vision from the Lord. The key here was he was actively doing something. In fact, he thought what he was doing was for the Lord. He had a commission from the government to kill Christians because he believed that the Christians and the disciples of Jesus' teaching were doing the wrong thing and destroying the Jewish faith that he loved so much. He thought he was, he was crushing an uprising of blasphemy among those that loved the Lord. He was well-intended, but he was absolutely doing the wrong thing. But at the end of the day, he was working. He wasn't sitting idly, idly by twiddling his thumbs, praying quietly in his room, just waiting for some great revelation from the Lord to fall in his lap. He was doing something. And God, I know this is a stretch. you got to get your head around this. God is big enough to work it out when you make a mistake and you're doing the wrong thing. He would rather find you doing the wrong thing and being actively in pursuit of him and correct that than have to drag your lazy behind off of a church pew or off of your sofa to get you to do something that matters for the sake of the kingdom. God is big enough to correct the mistake if you'll just go out and be so active that you have the opportunity to make one in the first place. You don't have to get everything in order and do it right. And even after you've got the vision and you're doing the right thing, you don't have to get it right every time, but you do need to be doing it. God's got enough grace not to condemn you for every little mistake. In fact, he would love to take that energy and redirect it rather than having to motivate you from zero. Paul wasn't sitting around waiting for God's vision and purpose to visit him. He was doing something when the Lord came. We've over-spiritualized this process of hearing and receiving We've made it some almost like a, a great Christian virtue that, well, I'm, I'm just sitting and waiting on the Lord. Not going to start my business, not going not to propose, not going to try and pray, not going to launch into ministry, not going to discipline my kids, not even going to pick which T-shirt I'm wearing this morning until I hear from Jesus. <sighs> Come on, that's not a virtue, that's laziness, that's rebellion, that's stubbornness and refusing to do anything. That's not what the Lord called you to do. Well, I'm tarrying in his presence. It feels so good here. I just don't want to, I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm just going to soak up the Lord. You know what happens if you stay in the shower and soak up the warmth and the comfort of that too long? Even if you're fortunate enough to have one of those water heaters where the hot water never gets cold, eventually you're going to shrivel up and you're going to swell up and your skin is going to start to get mold and mildew on it and you're going to begin to decay and rot while you stand there just soaking up the greatness because you're not doing anything with what's falling on you and what you're receiving. Even something that's good for you in small doses and in certain seasons of your life will destroy you if you insist upon laying in it and doing nothing with it. Well, I'm pondering things like Mary did when Jesus was there. You can ponder all you want, but sitting and pondering and waiting is not for those who seek the vision of the Lord. In fact, waiting is not what we do if we want to get the vision. Let me tell you what happens with waiting. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Not they that wait on the Lord will have a great letter dropped in their lap giving them instructions for everything the Lord wants them to do. Waiting is for people that have already done something and they're tired and they need to be refreshed and they need to be restored. You can sit around and ponder and wonder and wait when you've gone out and done something and you're tired and you've earned the rest. The guys on the bench don't get water when the timeout gets called. It's the five guys that have been running around the basketball court for 25 minutes. The provisions are for the people that are doing the work and expending the energy to actually do something. I'm not talking to unsaved people this morning. I understand the relationship you develop with the Lord has to begin before you're in this position. But as Christians, we've got to realize sitting around and waiting and tarrying for the Lord is only something we do when we're tired and need rest or when he's told you to sit and wait. Any other time, you're actively thumbing your nose at the will of God and you're saying, I don't want, don't care about, don't need, don't have the vision. You're not going to get it by sitting there. The verse doesn't say those that wait will receive a great vision and purpose from the Lord. It says those that are waiting will renew their strength because they're tired already from pursuing the vision and they need to be restored so they can go back out and pursue some more. 
You don't need strength to be renewed if you've not used any, and you can't replenish what's not there, and you can't revive what's not dead. If you never had it in the first place, there's no need to reapply. The short version of what I'm saying to you so far this morning can be condensed to this. If you need some kind of vision, go do something you already know how to do. If you need to receive a vision for the Lord, how about you do something with what you've already known? Because if you've met the Lord, he sure enough showed you something you haven't seen before. And if you're not doing anything with that, sitting and waiting is not going to accomplish anything to bring you more vision. God, listen to this, hear me this morning. God does not show up just to inspire lazy people to do something. Not once in Scripture does God show up to some lazy, do-nothing, good-for-nothing person and say, here's an idea, why don't you try this? Even those who were sick and dying and crippled and were absolutely worthless by society standards because they were sitting by the gate and begging or laying by a pool waiting for the angel to stir the water, even those people had to do something. They had to cry out and say, Son of David, don't pass me by. There's no excuse if you've met the Lord or know who the Lord is for doing nothing. God's not here to inspire the lazy. Look at the people that he did call, the big name guys, Peter, Andrew, James, John. They're all in the process of fishing. If you read the scriptures when they were called, they literally dropped their nets and walked away. They left their boat on the shore, and they had nets there. They had been catching fish. There may have still been fish in them. They were actively working. It'd be like somebody show up in the middle of the day, and you decide, I got six sheets of drywall to hang. I've got four of them up, but here's the Lord. Sorry, those two ain't getting done. I'm in the middle of something. And the Lord showed up and said, I've got a vision for you. Matthew was actually sitting at his desk. Now, I know we, you know, the guys that work hard, we look at the desk guys and say, <laughs> he's pushing a pencil and checking email and whatever. Still working, doing something, using their mind and their ability and their talent for the Lord. Matthew is sitting at a desk and just typing away. I know they didn't have typewriters. Just bear with me. It's an analogy, right? Matthew's writing in the ledger. He's figuring out who owes what and what am I going to collect and how much have I got and what percentage do I turn in and what percentage is my salary and how much of this do I... He's in the middle of doing that. Money piled up on the desk in pouches and people's names written down on the papers and Jesus comes by and Matthew gets up from the desk and begins to follow the Lord because he got the vision while he was doing something. Not while he was sitting at home waiting on the Lord to come knock on the door and tell him, turn off the TV, it's time to go do something for me. If you're waiting, it better be because God told you to wait because otherwise you're neglecting the vision he already gave you. God always comes with a vision. And the vision that God gives you will always be spoken in a language that you can understand. Every time it'll be a language you can understand. I told you nobody else can get the vision for you. God's going to speak to you in your language in a way that makes sense to you. How do I know that? Verse 14 says, he came to me speaking the Hebrew language, the language that Paul would have spoken. No human being who has ever seen God is confused about what they've seen or heard. Not one. Find me the scripture and show me the person who wasn't sure who he'd met and didn't know what he'd seen and had no idea. Jesus forces the decision. God forces the decision. If I show up, you're going to see something you didn't know was there that you didn't understand. You're going to have clarity, and you have to make a decision. Am I going to believe it and live it, or am I going to ignore it? But I'm certainly not going to be confused about it at the end of the day because the Lord's going to give a vision in a language you can understand. I'm going to hurt your brain and your heart for a minute, some of you, okay? I'm just warning you so you can brace yourself. God spoke to Paul in the Hebrew language because it was a language he could understand. Are you with me? We're okay with this. God did not speak to Paul in King James English. I'm not putting a pin in it. We're going to sit here for a minute. God did not speak to Paul in King James English. Why? King James wasn't invented yet. King James hadn't been in board, hadn't been born. English wasn't there. And even if it had existed, Paul wouldn't have understood it. And what mattered the most to the Lord is that my servant understands what I show him. The Lord certainly could have spoken King James to Paul, but it wouldn't have made sense to Paul, and so he didn't. 
He spoke to him in a language that made sense so that he could receive the vision and do something about it. The Word of God is older than the King's English, and it's older than Shakespeare, and it's older than Latin, and it's older than Greek, and it's older than Hebrew, and it's older than Aramaic. It's older than any language that we know. It's older than any living language. The thing that's important to the Lord is that my people hear my voice and see my vision and do something with it. God spoke to Paul in a language he could understand, and God's going to speak to you in a language that you can understand. It might be in pictures. It might be in words. It might be in English. It might be in King James, and God forbid, it might even be in the NIV. Lord, help us. What's the world coming to? It might be in a Spanish Bible. It might. What do you think the folks in China are reading? I can promise you it's not the King James Version of the Bible. I'm going to get off this soapbox now. No, I'm not. If you can't understand what's written in the King James, if that version of the Bible doesn't make sense to you, get one that you can read. Because the Lord wants to speak to you in a language that you can hear. And for you to hold the Word of God in your hand and not be able to understand it just because someone else told you that's not the right way to read it or hear it is blasphemy. The Lord says, I want to speak to you in a way you can understand me. And he's shown us in Scripture over and over and over that that's exactly what he does. He'll show up with water in the desert because people, when they're thirsty, they understand what water is. He'll speak to Paul in Hebrew because Paul knew Hebrew. He'll send Paul to other places to speak other languages because everybody around here doesn't speak Hebrew today. Don't let some religious devil keep you from having the vision of the Lord in your life. It's ridiculous. Sorry, I'm going to stop now. I'm not sorry. I am going to move on. I would camp there all day long. God will and God does and God must speak to you in a way that you understand it because no one else is going to receive God's vision for you. You've got to see it and hear it and understand it for yourself. Here's another thing that's going to break your brain this morning. It's not the primary job of your pastor or of a prophet or an evangelist to hear the word of God for you and to have a vision from the Lord for your life. God may certainly use those people to speak into your life and encourage you and, and, and confirm what you've heard in private. They may remind you of the vision that God has already given you, and they may point you in a direction if they see you steered the wrong way, but it's not their job to have the vision and the word for you. God doesn't communicate intimate details of your personal relationship with him by proxy. I don't send someone else to bed with my wife at night. She and I have a language there that none of you understand and ever will. The Lord wants an intimate, private relationship with you, and he's not going to send someone else to tell you the most intimate, private, personal details of what your relationship with him should look like. Not going to happen. Shouldn't happen. Be wrong if it did. Someone else says they have a vision from the Lord for you, question it immediately. I'm not saying throw it out with the bathwater. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying question it because if God speaks to me in my language about something personal to me that I'm supposed to understand, what this person said better line up with what I already know. In fact, I better be in such good relationship with the Lord that I have a good handle on what that vision and what that, that goal and what that purpose and what kind of relationship I have with him. I better know that because otherwise I can think and use my human logic to figure out really quickly, oh, what that person says makes sense. I gave you a, 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 an analogy not too long ago from this pulpit. I don't remember Sunday morning or a Sunday night, but I said someone once told me I should be a salesperson. And I, I won't spend too much time re-illustrating this, but if you know me, that's ridiculous. I may have a couple of qualities that seem to point to that. And if you don't know me very well, that might seem like a good idea. But if you know me personally, you know that kind of a job would absolutely drive me batty. But I could look at someone and they could say, well, you're good at this and you're good at that. You seem to check the boxes and you talk to people and, and, and you, you're, you seem to be outgoing and you seem to really like people and you're very intelligent and you're... So, I mean, you should do that. You can make a lot of money at it. That's a terrible idea if you're me. 
But if I don't have a good relationship with the Lord, I can sit around and I can let someone else use their logic and I can use my logic and I can say, you know what, it makes sense. But we don't question the word of the Lord with logic because his thoughts are not my thoughts and his ways are not my ways. I question it with my spirit. And if what my spirit senses when someone else says I've got a word for you doesn't line up with what God's already told me, I don't care how many letters they've got after their name, how big the podium they're standing behind is, or how many endorsements they came with from people you respect. If it doesn't line up with me, they've missed it. They don't know me. They don't know God the way I know God. What works in your house and your marriage isn't going to work in my house and my marriage because we got a different house and we're a different set of people. My relationship with the Lord is different than yours, and it has to be. We got different goals, different purpose. I was given a different vision by my God. So what you see from the outside in may be a good idea, but it doesn't have to say God's idea. We've got to have a good grasp on what the vision the Lord has given us is because if we lose the vision of God, we have ceased to grow spiritually. If I've lost the vision, I'm not growing anymore. We can't ever fulfill God's purpose if we don't apply what we say we believe about him to our everyday lives. I'm being very practical with you this morning. We think vision, and we go, what's the great vision statement of your church? What's the vision statement for my life? What's the huge accomplishment that I want to have achieved when I'm laying in my coffin? And what's the thing I want people to say about me as I'm laid out here on this side of the podium? We think about that as the vision. I need to build a city that is full of people that love the Lord. I I need to get an entire country saved. I, I need to have a great evangelistic ministry. Wait a minute. Nothing wrong with those things. But you won't fulfill God's purpose if you can't get up in the morning and spend the next 24 hours focused on the vision God gave you and applying what you know about him to every minute of every hour in that day. We can't simply stroll around waiting for God to give us some big moment to shine and then apply everything that we think we know about him and that we've learned about life and a spirituality all in that moment when everyone's looking and the spotlight is on me. Your life is not building to a climax like a superhero movie. I'm sorry. Pursuing God's vision is not about you spending the 40 or 60 or 80 or 100 years that you've got reaching toward one lofty goal. That's not the vision of the Lord. The vision of the Lord is that you apply what he has revealed to you about himself every single day in every aspect of your life. I told you, do something for the Lord. Do something with what you already know. You met him. You have a relationship with him. Start applying what he has shown you. How can I, in this situation, do something that relates to the vision of the Lord. When I'm having a conversation with my kids, when my wife and I are in the middle of an argument, when I run into a stranger at the grocery store, when I meet somebody from high school that I haven't seen in 25 years, or when I'm standing in a pulpit, or when I'm leading a meeting at work, if I'm on a job site, how can I take the vision the Lord has given me and apply it to this situation? That's the purpose of God. And that kind of integrity and consistency are more critical to fulfilling God's vision than you preparing for some defining moment will ever be. Our perspective on defining moment is completely warped when it comes to the things of the Lord because the defining moments are the daily application of the truth of Christ to your life. That's the defining moment. How often, how consistently did you define your vision and purpose in the Lord in your day. The defining moments aren't when 10,000 people are watching. They're the 10,000 times that two or three people saw you. It's the 10,000 times that a small group of people One, two, or three. Maybe it's just your kids. Maybe it's just your wife. Maybe it's just your parents. Maybe it's just your co-workers. The 10,000 times that those small gatherings of people saw you demonstrate by your actions that you believe who Christ is and what he's told you. It's not about having a big viewership on YouTube or having a stadium full of people or getting a celebrity interview. It's about 
hundreds upon hundreds of days of faithfully serving the Lord. God has exponentially more opportunities to reveal himself to you in your daily life than you're ever going to have big visible moments. God help us if the only time we could hear from the Lord was when we were in the spotlight. Some of us would never hear a word. Most of us would never hear a word. But you've got infinitely more opportunities to accomplish God's purpose and to hear his plan for your life and to see his vision for you and to see something great accomplished for the kingdom in your daily life than you will ever have in some big planned event. You have hundreds upon thousands of opportunities to hear and see and apply and get results if you'll look at the daily opportunities to fulfill and walk out the vision of God. Verse 16, if we keep reading this, he, the Lord is talking and he says, I've, to appoint you as a witness of what you have seen that I have revealed to you. This is the purpose. This is why I've shown up. That word witness there means one who is personally experienced by seeing or hearing something. I just told you, if I'm waiting on a big revealing moment, I may never see or hear what I'm expecting to from the Lord. And I will deprive myself of every benefit and every blessing, not only of this life, but of eternity, because I sat and waited for a moment that wasn't coming for me. And I missed thousands of opportunities because they didn't look the way I thought they would look. The witness has personally experienced and seen and heard something. And the Lord says, I've appointed you as a witness. Now we think of appointment as, you know, like King Arthur and, oh, I knight thee, I dub thee, whatever. I've appointed you. I've appointed you to a cabinet position. You now serve the president and you have a, a great influential job where the country is concerned. That's an appointment. When the Lord appoints something, it's not because he's given you a title and set you up somewhere high. The word that the Lord used here when he spoke to Paul to appoint means I have placed something in your hand. You have seen me as a witness personally. And you have heard what I had to say to you, and I have given you something that you can hold that is tangible. Now what are you going to do with it? It's your responsibility to apply and share the vision that God has revealed to you personally. Because vision is not just some grand plan to be executed. It's a personal and intimate revelation of God that must be applied to become anything more than a good idea. And the application of that, we see it in verses 17 and 18. The Lord says, I send you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that by faith in me they may receive forgiveness of sins and share among those who are sanctified. God's given you that vision. He's placed something in your hand and given you that experience, not for your own sake so you can stand around and get shriveled up like a prude in the shower, but so you can actually go out and do something with it. He gave you a vision for the sake of those around you who don't see him personally because they can see him in you. Hundreds upon thousands of opportunities to accomplish the vision of the Lord lie before you. And you're responsible for what you've witnessed and what's been placed in your hand. You're responsible to apply it to your life on a daily basis, and you're responsible to distribute it either by your example or by telling other people about it so that they can see what you already have. And once you've seen God's vision, you'll find that ignoring it will be a hardship upon you. This phrase it is hard to kick against the goads. A goad is basically a cattle prod. How do we get the stubborn donkey, yeah, I picked that word on purpose, to move if he won't move? We poke him with a stick until he is so uncomfortable he goes the direction we want him to go. I'm the one that you're persecuting, says the Lord, but now that you see me for who I am and I've given you a vision and a revelation of me, your life will be very difficult if you don't behave accordingly. It is hard to kick against the goads. Another way to say this would be rebellion will bring hardship upon you. If I can make it even more modern, how's that working out for you? Not doing what the Lord said. Not following what the Lord had in mind. How's that working out for you? He showed you. He told you. But you're not. So how's that going? Shoot me an email. Send me a text. Let me know. There's this big word that we see at the end of this passage that we read this morning, sanctification. It's the opposite of rebellion. It's the opposite 
of kicking against the Lord. It's the opposite of trying to ignore and pretend you didn't see and didn't know. It's the process of yielding to becoming more Christ-like. The Lord says, this is who I am, and this is the vision I have for you. And the way that you walk this out is you apply it every day in your life. If you don't, it won't go well for you. But if you do, you will become more like me. I told you once already, what, we've, what God reveals to us will make us uncomfortable. It can even go so far as to make you miserable if you don't keep the vision in front of you and do something about it. If you just think you're going to tuck that thing away and save it for later, we'll put a pin in that and walk away. That's not how it works. Keep the vision before you and function in every aspect of your life as if that is your purpose. And as you constantly pursue that vision, you keep it fresh in your mind and you apply it to your life, you're going to draw closer to him and you'll become more like him. And here's the thing. We know that verse in Scripture says we see in part, we prophesy in part. We don't get to see the whole plan of the Lord. But I sure enough would like to see more of it, wouldn't you? I would like to see and understand more of what God has in mind than what he has shown me already. Rather than pretending what he showed me is not good enough, and that I'm not content with that. Rather than putting a pin in it or shoving it in a drawer, the Lord says, if you will work toward sanctification, if you will become more like me, if you will not rebel and will do something active with what I've given you, he says in verse 16, I will make you a witness of what you have seen and of what I will reveal. God wants to show you more than you have already seen, and he is eager to do it if you'll simply begin doing with what you have instead of waiting to see more to try it out. Our faithfulness, the true test of our faith comes in the time when we are waiting for vision that tarries. I only have this piece of it, Lord, and I don't want to do anything with just that. I need to see the rest. No, 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 no. Wait. Habakkuk 2, 3, if you read that second verse, we like that. Write the vision on the wall so people can see it and run with it. But then there's the second half of that in verse Three that says though the vision tarries wait for it I gave you a piece of it I showed you something I gave you some clarity some understanding now I'm telling you put it into practice and become more like me because I want to make you a witness of what I showed you and what I will reveal when this is worked out in you the true test is waiting for the vision that tarries that whole sanctification process, that process of learning not to rebel and to keep the vision in front of me, that happens over time. And God reveals more of himself to me as I'm faithful in what I know. And a lot of times those additional revelations that we're looking for are the how. Well, Lord, I've seen this vision of a great thing you have for me. How do I get there? Well, start by pretending that what he told you is true and live like it is. And if you make a mistake, he'll be just as faithful with you as he was with Paul to say, Aunt, that's not the way to do it. Nope, sorry. And he's not going to embarrass you in front of people and treat you poorly. He's going to pull you aside in that private, intimate place that's just between you and him where the vision comes from in the first place. And he's going to say, can we do this a little differently? I prefer it when you, you know, it will go better for you if we, when you did that, it didn't work. But it's not the end of the world. We'll start working on the how once we start working on doing in the first place. We'll get those additional revelations, but only if we're faithful to what we've seen and faithful on a daily basis to that vision. The additional revelations that God wants to give you will make clear to you. Oh, and please remember this. He will make clear to you that your interpretation of that big thing he showed you was probably not what he had in mind. I had an idea when I was a young man and people told me I was going to preach what that was going to look like. I envisioned stadiums of people and a band with about 30 people in it and a horn section and multiple guitars and a whole choir of singers and I would come up and people would stand and cheer because they loved to hear when I preached the word of the Lord and I would go from town to town and I would fill up football stadium after football stadium. In my own mind, when I was three, four, five years old, I was, I was Billy Graham, but I was a lot cooler than him. I had better hair and I didn't have to wear a suit. And my band was more like a rock band. But God told me I would minister. And over time, the additional revelations have made very clear that that's not 
yes, yes, son, you're going to preach and you're going to teach and you're going to see great work in my kingdom, but it's not going to look like that. I'm going to bring some clarity to this vision for you. And that only came because I was faithful to go out and believe no matter what obstacles I ran into. I'm going to preach. The Lord called me to preach. I know he did. And no matter how many people told me that I had no call and no matter how many people said they didn't like the way I preached and how many people stood between me and what the Lord had in mind, I continued to live on a daily basis. The Lord wants me to preach the word. And when it meant that I got to share a Bible verse with somebody at work, I thought that was the greatest thing in the world, that they pulled me out in the aisle and said, hey, can you br- we know you know the Bible. Can you answer this question? And it was a long process, 44 years so far, of God refining, and he's continuing to do that. But commitment to his vision is going to bring clarity by separating my understanding from the truth of his will. Oswald Chambers says, we can't bring the vision of God to fulfillment through our own efforts. We must live under its inspiration until it fulfills itself. God will fulfill the vision. Philippians 1.6 says, I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ's return. God has a vision for each of you. And he started to reveal it to you the day that we started your rela- or the day you started your relationship with him. And it's his vision, it's not yours. And because it's his, it's him that's going to fulfill it. It's just your job to be faithful to it and remember what it is. See, Paul ends his account with this statement. He says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I'm going to make a couple of statements. If you'll stand with me, we're going to close this morning. If I take that statement that Paul made and I I modernize it, Paul's saying, I have taken advantage of every opportunity I had to demonstrate with my life that I believe what God showed me about himself. This morning, I want to encourage you to do something. When we talk about the vision, we're not talking about a big picture. We're talking about little moments through your everyday life of remembering what God has revealed to you and applying it at every opportunity that you have. This morning, the Lord says this to you. Keep my vision before you live constantly under the inspiration of the vision that you've received. Take advantage of every opportunity you have to accomplish my purpose with what I've shown you about me. Be prepared at all times for me to continually reveal myself to you as you are faithful to me. And allow me to complete the work in you that I began with the vision you've seen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for this message and the opportunity to gather with your people. And I thank you for this word and the understanding of what you mean when you say you have a vision and a call and a purpose for each of us. I pray that you would give us wisdom in walking out what you have for us to do. That you would begin to show us those hundreds and thousands of opportunities we have in our day and in our week to apply what we know. And I pray that your spirit would give us the strength and the courage and the focus and the wisdom and the insight, even in difficult times when the vision would tarry and we don't have a clear picture. And I pray, God, that we would be receptive rather than rebellious when the correction comes to push us in the direction of what you have in mind rather than what we see it is. God, we wait for your clarity. We're excited that you speak to us. We're glad to know that you're continually, actively, intimately, and personally involved in our lives. And this morning, we stand here making a commitment to keep your vision before us and to be faithful to it until the day of your return. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. You are dismissed. Hope you have a great day, and I'll get to see you again soon.